Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. In this program, we discuss a range of issues. The platform for this program is the Center for Security Strategy and Policy Research. CESPA is a policy research center housed in the University of Lahore and researches contemporary security and strategic issues. This program is part of that effort, and we aim to speak with national and international scholars and policy experts on a broad range of issues that have a bearing on value. Welcome back to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. I Actually, I'm greatly tempted to begin this program with a sigh because we're going to discuss Pakistan's economic woes. And that, as we all know, uh, unfortunately seems to be a fairly uh, consistent issue uh, throughout many decades. Now, I'm not an economist and perhaps not even entirely what you could call an informed generalist. Uh, which essentially means doing a lot of legwork or research, if you will, to find out what the experts say about the boom and bust cycles of Pakistan's economy. I was also incidentally struck by a statement a couple of months ago by Pakistan's current finance minister when he told the media that no one should worry since he had been dealing with the IMF for 25 years. I guess the statement was meant to burnish his credentials as the best choice to deal with the economy, but the irony of his own statement was clearly lost on him. I mean, what kind of economic mismanagement over 25 years or more would keep sending a country back to the IMF? Anyway, every expert seems to know how to streamline the economy, including those who have had a shot at actually doing it but failed. And while there are differences in where to put the emphasis, the basics remain the same, more or less. So my question to myself was, and I'm sure this is also a question most of us outside the discipline of economics ask, if experts know what to do, why can't they fix it? Could it be that there's a difference between economics as taught and conceptualized and how the real economy works here? I suspect that to be the case. It's like Counterinsurgency. Now, counterinsurgency is a subject that I'm familiar with. So one can put forward lots of theories, but the ground proves very frustrating. There's also the balloon effect. You fix one thing and its side effects pop up from elsewhere. An even better analogy, I think, would be the classic arcade game, whack-a-mole. The moles pop up in these five holes and you whack them with a the mallet to score. But as the game progresses, the moles pop up faster than you can whack them. Is fixing the economy, given multiple vested interests, now become our whack-a-mole problem? I don't have an answer to it, but I have with me someone who might. Or even if he doesn't, he might inform us of the complexity of the problem. So let me welcome Dr. Mifta Ismail to this program. Dr. Ismail a PhD from Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania as a former finance minister of Pakistan. Before that, he was advisor on finance to the prime minister. He also headed the Federal Board of Investment, has a vast experience of finance and political economy, both given his public service and also as a business person. So, Mifta, thank you for being on the program. Let's begin with a, a sort of a statement for the, for the informed journalist or the laypersons. Uh, that is to say that we can grow the economy maybe by 3 to 4 percent. And the minute we, and the structure of the economy is such that the minute we try and get growth over 4 percent, we run into a current account deficit problem, uh, which is to say that our imports uh, become very, very high and our exports uh, remain where they were. And so we run out of foreign exchange. Uh, that is the fundamental problem that we've not been able to solve. And uh, you know, that, that, that we've not really, really even tried to solve. So that, that is the fundamental problem that every time yes. we, we try to uh, grow, uh, we get into a current account deficit. Okay. So what exactly is, obviously, there's, there's got to be some reason for that. Is it because of the fact that we haven't really... Uh, uh, become productive in a diverse kind of way, that we are a protectionist economy, uh, that we get into this external imbalance uh, where our, you know, we don't really have any non-debt raising uh, revenue sources. 
uh, what exactly is the issue here? So th there are there are there are several issues that that uh, come together in this. Uh, number one is that we have very high uh, fiscal deficits. That you have a high fiscal deficit, uh, government borrow money to pay for it, and uh, because Pakistanis have a lot of savings, they end up borrowing money from foreigners. Uh, which is another way of saying that there is going to be current account deficit. The so foreign lend you money by giving you more import and taking in less exports from. That's the first problem. Then, of course, our taxation relies entirely on imported goods. We tax mostly imported goods coming in through our country, through our ports. And uh, what, what that means is that we have a high protection barrier. We protect our industries uh, through a policy we call import substitution. And that allows our industries to make money even if they are very inefficient. And it turns out that our industry is so inefficient that it's not able to compete internationally. And so we can only export $30 billion worth of wood, which is about 8.5% or 8% of GDP. Uh, whereas really, I mean, a good dynamic economy should be exporting 20% of GDP or something like this. As long as Pakistan doesn't have uh, at least 15% of GDP exports, we will continue to go back to the IMF. Our imports, on the other hand, because we are such an uh, unproductive economy, our imports, on the other hand, also dependent on fuel, et cetera, and food for foreigners, um, uh, you know, uh, for on imports, uh, be because we rely on imports for fuel and food. Uh, so our imports are about 25% uh, of GDP. 23% of GDP. And so there's a huge gap between import and export. And every time we try to move the economy, the imports go up, and then we have to bring down the economy, which is the bust, you know, which we call the bust cycle. So the number one problem is that our taxation relies overwhelmingly on imported products in direct taxation. Uh, we are wrong about uh, import substitution. We should try and do export promotion. And, and then there is a problem of lack of imagination. Every time our economy is slow and we want to move the economy, uh, our policymakers uh, give breaks to the richest Pakistanis. Last time, for instance, the state bank gave short loans of 570 billion rupees to the richest Pakistanis at 1%. And when they try and set up factories, uh, by the time they've set up factories and they've imported all the machines and all the capital goods and cars and whatnot, you know, our economy overeats and then we have to slow it down. So the very ostensible reason for giving these tax breaks and subsidies to the rich was that they would, you know, some of this benefit would trickle down. It doesn't even trickle down. By the time the trickle down part starts, you have to slow the economy down. So uh, the poor in Pakistan really are not part of the economic mainstream. We don't educate our children. Uh, and, and, and so our best and brightest are working as dhobis and masis and not working as scientists and, and entrepreneurs that, that, that they do in the rest of the world. Okay, I, I know. I, I'm going to come back to this 1% uh, issue because I know that you've been talking about it. You also wrote an excellent op-ed for Dawn on this. But if I've understood you correctly, and my apologies, as I said in my opening also, I am not an economist, uh, that, you know, going back to the uh, earlier question of what are our non-debt raising revenue sources, so you've got exports but you have a very low uh, uh, base, uh, uh, you know, a, a small base and low value added, non-competitive. Then you have the remittances and then you have the FDI. But most of the FDI is essentially con consumption related. There's nothing in relation to ex export industry. So, so therefore, uh, I'm assuming that you won't find too many people either inside Pakistan or from outside to come and invest here. Uh, have I got that right? Absolutely, 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 yes. I mean, our FDI, for instance, is $2 billion, a yearly FDI. And just for comparison, India's FDI is $100 billion this year. Last year it was $85 billion. And, and as you rightly said, that our FDI is not for exports. Uh, the foreigners who invest in Pakistan want to only sell to Pakistanis. They don't want to make stuff in Pakistan, merchandise in Pakistan and export. And, and so our FDI then in some ways becomes a burden on our, our foreign exchange, if not on our economy. Uh, because now we have to also 
you know, you know, service that FDI and give profits to the foreigners in foreign currency, but they're not producing any foreign currency in Pakistan, whereas FDI in other countries, uh, you know, Vietnam, for instance, or China or Malaysia, uh, the FDI re results in increased exports. Nothing of the sort happened in Pakistan. Right. So, uh, as I said, exports, uh, a narrow base, low value added, uh, FDI we just talked about. Uh, let's get to the issue of remittance. Now, we uh, rely very heavily on remittance. Uh, we keep sending unskilled or semi-skilled labor to the Gulf. So, if we have to rely on remittance, is it rocket science to try and target countries with aging populations and to actually see because you know, lots of these countries like Japan, Germany, Canada, even Australia, they're actually looking for uh, labor, uh, skilled labor force. So actually target these, uh, these uh, states and these economies by training people to see where we can send the people. Uh, is that something uh, too complicated for us not to be able to do? Yes, anything that requires real work and real difference is something that the government of Pakistan, any government of Pakistan is not capable of doing. I mean, the government of Pakistan, um, you know, as they say, is not able to even knock the skin of rice pudding. Um, I remember that, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the, the uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, you know, went to Kuwait to try and persuade Kuwaitis to give Pakistanis visas, but the Kuwaitis in the end did not budge. And the reason was that a lot of Afghan citizens were given Pakistani passports and, and they were worried about, you know, potential terrorism, you know, from them. Uh, we have very lax control about immigration. We can't, you know, uh, uh, process this information correctly. The police reports from Pakistan are not very reliable. We don't train our people. We don't give skills to our people, skills that are needed. I mean, and now we are competing in a world where Philippines, for instance, you know, is sending nurses and, and sales officers and sales assistants and all that stuff. Uh, Eastern European countries, Central Asian countries uh, are sending their citizens who are far more educated than Pakistanis, you know, and, and vying for the same job. So we are now basically uh, relegated to jobs that require just, you know, brawn and, and absolutely hardly any skills. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and so uh, the remittance uh, has also been a shrinking uh, revenue. So, I mean, it's, it's an increasing source for Pakistan in, in absolute terms, but relative to the world's remittance, it's a shrinking source. Uh, the better jobs, um, be it computer specialists and all that, are going to Indian citizens. Uh, more service-oriented jobs are going to Filipinos. Uh, and Pakistan really is not specialized in anything now. No, so... If we know that that is a that's a problem, uh, and since you've been in government, has there ever been any effort to address it? And, there has and, been and let me and let me let me add because you know if we have a narrow uh, manufacturing base, we export low value added. If our FDI is more consumption oriented, then remittance is something that perhaps we should be targeting. I'm not saying in exclusion to other things, but, but you know, something which is already getting us a lot of money. But if we were to actually send targeted skilled labor force uh, to countries, as I said, where the populations are aging, we obviously would be able to get more. And you just gave the example of Philippines, India, and some others. Uh, we can't just sit back. And, and say that this is something we just can't do. Well, I mean, we have been sitting back and some saying that we there is nothing we can do. I mean, the, the, what the government of Pakistan does, and this is across all parties, is that you know, every time some prime minister is going to some Gulf country, Gulf country, for instance, they would talk about, you know, uh, excellency gave more visas to Pakistani than, you know, and, and the Arab uh, Amir would probably promise it, sometimes even deliver, sometimes not. Uh, but has there ever, and, and we, you know, sometimes we will, you know, talk of, you know, talk of, you know, conventions and politicians will give speeches. But has there ever been a training program uh, to train Pakistanis? What is, what is stopping that? What is stopping? I mean, that's my question. I mean, there are issues of politics, as I said in my opening also, that, you know, perhaps there is a, there is a difference between 
the theory and concept in a classroom that also happens in my area which is international relations and what happens on the ground but at the and so there are political issues also we're going to come to those issues uh, which are issues of political economy more than you know economic management itself but what exactly does the government do in you know since we 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 constantly talking about streamlining the economy if we just sit, sitting back not doing anything then what exactly are we doing are we only focused on going to the imf on going to saudi arabia or qatar or china and asking them to you know sort of fill up our our coffers with a billion dollar here and a couple of billion dollars there but that, I mean, see, so so much of Pakistan's economic policy actually boils down to what what we just said, you know, going to uh, uh, friendly countries and going to you know lenders of last resort and you know just trying to survive. Um, has there? I mean, and, and every 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 government, whether it's PTI, PML, and People's Party, they all wish that we would have more labor, you know, skilled labor going abroad, in and 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 we would have you know greater labor remittance. You know, they are all sincere. But the fact is that there is a lack of capacity, lack of competence, and absolute lack of will and determination. There is absolutely no resolve, you know. And the government, the rules of governance are such that nothing gets done. So that I do not know of sustained programs that train Pakistanis uh, in particular professions and send Pakistanis to particular countries. Um, yes, sure. I mean, you know, right now, Qataris, for instance, are doing this FIFA World Cup and they haven't hired Pakistanis and we're very happy and, and, and all that stuff. But, but, but that's more, you know, uh, that's more good luck for Pakistan that that event was happening. But has there been a sustained program in Pakistan over decades that trains Pakistanis to work in foreign countries, to maybe teach basic Arabic, to maybe teach basic English, to maybe teach plumbers? You know, rather than sending just these guys who can go and dig roads, why can't we send plumbers and electricians? Uh, but we don't do that. Um, and 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 also, uh, you know, you talked about uh, other aging aging Western democracies, Japan, and all that. But I mean, basically, our um, you know labor is essentially concentrated uh, in only in, uh, in in the Middle East. Uh, I know you will find Pakistanis everywhere, uh, but that's really Pakistanis. On their own initiative, trying to get out of Pakistan. In a right. wide survey, 40% of Pakistanis want to leave Pakistan. That's a horrible um, report card on the state of governance in Pakistan. But has Pakistani government done anything to help our citizens? No. Okay. Now, uh, I'm also going to take a break and uh, bring in uh, Dr. Ali Hassanan. But before that, so let's get to uh, manufacturing. Now, you have also said, and this is borne by empirical evidence, that wherever there's been economic growth, it's been export oriented. Now, you, you might recall that there was a debate within a group uh, where uh, there was this debate about whether we need to have an industrial policy. Uh, there were proponents, there were opponents. But my question is, again as a layperson, that if we cannot identify certain key industries to target exports where you can actually leapfrog and diversify, how do you actually uh, broaden that manufacturing base and have economic growth uh, tied up with your exports? Okay, so I mean, my view is that it's very difficult for governments to figure out what are the future technologies and future industries, you know, uh, that would be winners in the future. What are the industries that would be winners in the future? Uh, for instance, today, solar energy is much cheaper than wind energy, but, you know, a few years ago, solar was more expensive than wind energy. So we can't really know. But what we do know is that, for instance, information technology and all this computer, you know, software, you know, that's a, not just raised now and it's not it's more than a fashionable thing it's actually a substantial industry that's going to only continue to grow but government need not to favor particular firms but the government needs to train people okay no, so, so, uh, so i'm not sorry i'm interjecting but i'm not saying the government should regulate although there have been cases like south korea china two of the <laughs> biggest such cases where uh, you know, the, the state or the governments identified uh, 
areas, key industries, gave incentives, uh, rewards, and also punished, uh, you know, in a number of ways. And I don't have to tell you this, you, you the expert here. So my point really is that uh, the government is neither facilitating in terms of creating a conducive environment nor actually identifying areas where it can begin to facilitate. So it, it's a it's a double whammy. So 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 I think I think I think we, we don't need to you know get bogged down in, in, in the details of industrial policy. What we need to understand is that our problem right now is that we have ex, export imports uh, which are two and a half times more than export. So what we need to do is to export more. The government needs to have a policy that favors exports and that punishes uh, companies that make products for domestic consumption, not just giving carrots, but also use some sticks. I think the time has really come now. Okay. This is what Korea has done. This is what other countries have done. Now, yes, you're right that Korea picked winners and Korea actually even nominated firms, chibols, you know, that, that, that got a lot of credits and all that. And it went really well in Korea, but it also went badly in Philippines. It also went badly in Malaysia. What we need to do is to not pick firms and, 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 and groups, you know, that, that get our favor. But we need to have generalized policy where we actually punish consumption in companies that make only for domestic consumption. We need to encourage companies of every type to export more and more. And, and we need to reorient our economy to our exports. And government should try and educate our workforce so that you know these people can grow up to become you know export champions. But that's what what we are doing. Right. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, there, there's there have also been problems with the chai balls. Uh, they they actually picked up the model from Japan uh, with the you know the uh, uh, pre World War II zaibatsu's and then keretsu's and all that. And there, there have been problems with that model also. But we, what my, my point really was that something has already been done. One can look at it and try and glean what is doable, the, you know, the pluses of that, and then try and reduce the, the negatives of that. I was in conversation with Dr. Mifta Ismail, who is still with us, but I am also joined by Dr. Sayed Ali Hassanan, who is an associate professor in the uh, economics department at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Ali, thank you for uh, being on the program. Uh, I know you were listening in uh, on my conversation with uh, Mifta. So uh, I want to give you uh, the, the opportunity for an opening statement on the basis of what has been discussed so far, and then we can take it further from there. Uh, great. Thank you for having me. Um, I think the broad contours of what has been discussed is um, absolutely correct. And it's also something that economists have understood for quite a while. So to recap, um, we have low productivity, um, low savings, and uh, an import-oriented or a protectionist uh, economy. I think the fundamental question to start with is to ask, um, what, is the, what is the goal of the economy? And the goal is to maximize the goods and services that we are producing. Um, a secondary uh, goal, but one that has sort of come to predominate because of how poorly we've handled it, is the balance between imports and exports. Um, but that focus on productivity is important. Now, I think um, you know you were just talking before the break about how we need to target certain industries or not, and I think the government sometimes tries to do too much because it's not doing the basics right. And I'd uh, suggest that perhaps what we need to do is actually reduce the footprint of what the government is trying to do and to focus in on those things that we are doing really terribly. So um, the ones that I'm most fond of highlighting, and in part because they are absolutely fundamental to a market economy's functioning and entirely neglected in the conversation on the Pakistan economy, um, st starts with the rule of law. Now, Pakistan ranks 139th out of 140 countries on the rule of law index, right? Um, in terms of education, I'd encourage your audience to uh, review the lower secondary completion rates um, of countries in South Asia, and you'll find that in Pakistan, 50% of our students complete lower secondary. In Bangladesh and India, it's about 90%, right? We have consistently underinvested in education for decades. 
And as a result, we don't have a single university that is ranked above, let's say, about 350 um, in the world rankings of universities, uh, the QS world rankings, whereas India has six. The, the major public sector universities, and I'm thinking of the likes of Punjab University, University of Engineering and Technology, UETs, um, you know, uh, the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, are all ranked below 800, which is effectively, you know, these are places that are not, and, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So if you look at the product that's being produced, the, you know, the education that we're imparting to even those lucky enough to go to university, um, are these factories for producing people who are either adding to the cultural fabric of the country or adding to the productivity or going abroad and really holding down strong jobs? Well, one piece of evidence that I find to be very uh, interesting is to look at what Indian Pakistanis versus, uh, sorry, Indian Americans versus Pakistani Americans earn in the US. So uh, we were, you were talking about remittances earlier. Um, and in most of our high value workers will go to Europe or the US. And uh, the data that the US collects on the, the average income of the Pakistani American is that we're earning about $75,000 per year there on average, which is a decent amount. But compare that to the average Indian and they're earning 120, right? And so the question then becomes, why is it that um, the average Indian that India has exported to the US versus the average Pakistani that goes to the US, why are they able to earn better? And the answer is simple. And I think this is something that everyone understands that India invested back in Nehru's day in the uh, IITs and the IIMs, the Institutes of National Importance. And, you know, they're, they're harvesting the fruit of that labor. Now, the question is, the interesting question to ask is, why did Pakistan not invest in those universities? And why is it or in our own universities? Um, and I, it's, this is something that's really frustrating because if you look at Pakistan's trade balance historically, um, from a YouTube's era till today, I believe, and Mr. Saab can correct me if I'm wrong, there have been something like three years in which we've run a trade surplus. Every other year, we've run a trade deficit. In other words, every other year, our exports have underperformed imports. So then the question is, why is the ruling class in Pakistan so comfortable with running the economy into the ground? And the answer to my mind is that um, they found ways to remain politically relevant. And I'm thinking both of politically elected, the, the politically elected ruling class and those who come into power without being elected. Both of those categories of rulers have figured out ways to preserve their power and their interests despite the economy being run into the ground. But this is this is very interesting, and let me take this uh, back to Mifta Ismail. So, Mifta, you talked about one percent, as I said, you also wrote an excellent op-ed in Dawn. Uh, you've also been talking about this one percent uh, elite capture problem in your talks at various uh, universities and think tanks. The issue is that let's let's assume that. That is not something that can be rectified immediately. However, for this 1%, not for any altruistic reasons, but purely in terms of self-interest, to decide that they need to do something in order to increase the pie and not continue to squeeze this lemon that has already been almost squeezed dry. Is that not possible? I mean, in the sense that, as I said, it's not altruism. It's, it's just pure self-interest. So, uh, you know, that depends on the coalitions that form. Right now, we have an elite which is happy to extract a large share of the pie. And when you have growth, when you grow the pie, the biggest beneficiaries will not be the elites. The biggest beneficiaries will be the middle classes, the working class people who will then transition into middle class and upper middle class 
and, and transition to a more comfortable you know, life. Uh, the rich will become absolutely richer in absolute terms, but not relative to the rest of the world. But the rest of the world hasn't been able to do it. The rest of the world has a seen its uh, countries grow and which has helped everybody, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, but in Pakistan, the coalition is such that uh, the rich people are just concentrating and focusing on keeping their large share of the pie. Um, now, it, there are many reasons and, and you know, some, uh, you know, for that. Uh, but the issue is that, that, I mean, I feel that Pakistan is one of the worst governed countries in the world. Uh, that India has left us behind in the 1990s. Bangladesh has left us behind. Pakistan has a lower average income than sub-Saharan African countries. Pakistan has a lower income than any country in South Asia, including Sri Lanka, except for Nepal, which is a landlocked country, you know, a very resource-poor landlocked country. So Pakistan has been a horribly, a horrible example of governments, whether it's, I mean, think of law and order, for instance. We, we've had issues with extremism, terrorism, crime since the 1990s. We've had every type of government, martial law, you know, hybrid democracy, presidential system, prime minister system, nothing has worked. Nothing has worked. Uh, we've talked about, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we've talked about exports. The export, uh, the percentage of export as a percentage of GDP has been going down constantly over the years. Uh, so the government of Pakistan is a completely ineffective. And, 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 and I think that one of the things that the elite now need to do, because we are now skirting, you know, with, with, with disaster, is to think of now making a, the government more effective. And the basic things that I talk about, actually, is that to educate the people, to give them health care and stuff like that, that's really the, the minimum, minimum the government can do, the elites can do. And that obviously will help them as well. So, uh, so, and, and, and help so, the so you agree with what I was saying that, you know, if not for altruistic reasons, purely for the sake of self-interest, they need to begin to do certain things. Now, this obviously is less uh, uh, an economic problem and more uh, 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 sort of sociological, shall I say, or a political economy problem. But when, sorry, you want to say something. See, the thing is, elite is also not a monolith. I mean, there, there is business elites, there is political elite, there is military elites and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, when you loosen the grip on the economy, the bureaucratic elite and the military elite and the political elite will not be doing so well. The business elite will still do much well. You know, you have the Ambani's and Advani's in India and stuff like that, and there will be more people like this. But but there will be some transfer of, you know, of, of wealth from, uh, from the, the, you know, the political elite uh, the military elite and the bureaucratic elite towards the middle classes. And that's why this coalition yeah, but, but, is holding. But, 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 but here's, here's, the, here's the problem. You talked about the Ambani's and the rest of it. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but my own impression is that we don't have that kind of business elite in this country. As a matter of fact, what we do have, like, you know, the automobiles wala or the textile wala's, uh, protectionists, uh, creating lobbies and cartels, going to the different governments, getting their things done, not allowing the manufacturing base to broaden, uh, just getting their SROs or call it what you will, shackling the economy of the country and dominating it. Now, that's not the kind of model that will ever allow any kind of real economic growth. You want me to answer or Ali? No, I want you to answer, then I'm going to take this to Ali. Okay, so 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 the thing is that I mean, uh, and and this I think you've you've really pointed your finger at what the problem is. The Pakistani money elite, you know, the business elite, at least I'm talking about, is rich not just because they they're innovative and all that stuff, but mostly because they've you know they've played with SROs, they've played with subsidies, they've got you know uh, quotas and, and and monopoly rents and stuff like that. This is not Wipro and Infosys and all that country companies that are, you know, creating value or that are, you know, innovating stuff like that. Okay. This is, you know, so, so that's the first part of it. A lot of these fertilizer companies, for instance, get cheaper gas and, and they make a lot of money out of this um, and, and such and so on and so forth. Um, some of, so, so this is not the sort of elite that is conducive towards growth. Uh, but nonetheless, I still think that if, if, the, if the economy will were to grow, the, the, you know, the richer rich people will become richer for no doubt. But the greater benefit of growth to, in the economy 
will be uh, without a doubt the middle classes of Pakistan. Right, Ali Hasnan. Um, so I have a slightly different take. Which I absolutely agree with both of you that um, we have a substantial part of the business elite that is, uh, you know, perpetually habitualized into uh, into looking for uh, both protectionism and for uh, special benefits, SROs and so on. Um, but at the same time, this is endogenous. This is uh, in part a resu the result of policies that we have had. And we have grown um, some of the business elite of this country over time. And think about real estate, which 20 years ago, the real estate business interests were nowhere near as powerful as they are today. They grew in part because of the policies that we put in place. The fact that we did not put, for example, a land tax in place uh, when, when we should have. And so we can also start thinking about how to um, how to move away and to create the circumstances in which the elite will perhaps start to move away. There's a statistic that perhaps not enough people pay attention to, um, and I think it's uh, important to emphasize. Um, in the Musharraf era, we had, you'll remember, the dollar at 60 rupees for a very long time, 55 to 60 rupees. What, and, and people often in conversation and drawing room talk will often say, you know, Musharraf era was great because uh, things were cheap, uh, the dollar was stable. What people perhaps don't pay attention to is that Pakistan's exports as a percentage of GDP, which we've all said at the start of this conversation, is one of the most important things yes. for the economy uh, to worry about. The Pakistan's exports as a percentage of GDP fell from 15% the year Musharraf took power to 12% when he left. That's a 20% drop. Mm. In the PMLN government of 2013 through 2017, similarly, Darsa was following his uh, dollar equals 100 formula, and exports as a percentage of GDP fell from 13% to 8%. That's a 38% drop. So earlier, I think, I, th I, I forget, I think it was Mifta Saab who said, perhaps we need to get exports from 18% to 8% uh, to 16%. Well, actually, the year Musharraf took power, Pakistan was ex exporting 15%. We just had 1% to, to make up to, to get to that level. The fact, the frustration is that it appears that bad economics has become good politics in Pakistan. Oh. And in part, that's because our, um, our media has not brought these core facts about the economy to enough people uh, and created, you know, put this on the agenda um, where people are losing elections because of the drop in exports. Now, if we're able to reverse this, and, and in part, I'm very wedded to the idea that you have to have a free float of the exchange rate, uh, Darsab's protestations notwithstanding. Um, if you're able to move away from, from this and you're able to move towards not necessarily encouraging exports, but at least not uh, rigging the system against exports, um, then you'll start to see a gradual, maybe it'll take 10, 15, 20 years, but you'll start to see a gradual reversal to where we were in 98. And that's something we have to talk more about. Right, now that's a, that's a great uh, sort of expression that bad economics is becoming good politics. I would, Mifta Ismail, I would think that it's now becoming messy politics and creating a major problem with reference to the already complex uh, lay of the land as far as political economy is concerned. But let me, um, uh, talk about uh, this constant mantra about increasing revenue. Now, it's like we need money. Uh, let's put a super tax here. Let's tax the, the, the mobiles or let's, let's tax the laptops. That essentially means more indirect taxes. So you basically, as I said, and you know, I'll use the same expression again. You're squeezing the same lemon over and over. And you are burdening, instead of increasing the size of the pie, you are burdening the same people who are in the, in the tax net. And so you are you're leaving them with no surplus to either save or invest. Uh, uh, just uh, the, a small point that the super tax, of course, is not an indirect tax. It's a direct tax because it's, 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 it's an income tax. 
And uh, when we uh, came in government and when I became finance minister, you know, we, we, the IMF was very worried about our uh, uh, runaway expenses. You know, we were, you know, our, our, our uh, deficit, uh, pri primary deficit was more than 3% of GDP and they wanted us to uh, bring it to uh, bring it into surplus in, in this fiscal year. Uh, so we had to come up with a lot of new taxes. Um, there is also the other possibility of cutting down expenses, uh, but that's not possible either. Uh, so we have, for instance, an NFC award, which awards 57% uh, revenues to the provinces. Uh, um, the provinces uh, don't really collect their own taxes and nor have they actually given powers to the federation. Uh, so to the local level, they've kept power themselves. Uh, the, fed the federal government never actually cut down the expenses it was supposed to once it hands over a lot of the responsibilities to the provinces. Just to give you an example, I mean, the federal government is not allowed to keep an agriculture ministry, but it kept a ministry called food security. And even today, we are subsidizing the imports of seeds. We are subsidizing uh, urea. We are subsidizing, you know, DAP, agriculture imports. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, the federal government has kept its hands in every pie and it's not curtailed. The provinces now have a duplicate bureaucracy, maybe of you know, inconsistent policy, quality, but a duplicate bureaucracy. So we, this is not a government that is considered, you know, cutting down expenses. Uh, if you're not going to cut down expenses, if that is politically and constitutionally not viable, then, you know, raising revenue is the only game in town. Um, we try to raise as much, as much uh, direct taxes as possible. Uh, but there is a limit in a country which is largely undocumented. I went in, in places where no other finance minister has ever gone, which is to tax land, 1% tax every year. Uh, I don't know whether that will stay or not. But I mean, but we've actually done stuff that, that you know, that others have not done. And, and what Ali Asnan, uh, Dr. Ali Asnan says is absolutely right. I mean, this, this real estate business, um, investments uh, in really not even in the construction industry, but in real estate, you know, speculation in real estate. I mean, that's the best business in Pakistan. And when that is the best business, it's it's just an artifact of our policy uh, failures and it's nothing to do with real economic progress. Right. Now, you know, we can keep discussing these issues uh, till cows come home, but uh, <laughs> I, there's always paucity of time when doing such program. So uh, before I close this, Mefta Ismail, tell me, uh, what can we do possibly, if at all, to get out of this bog in which we have landed ourselves? I mean, we haven't been able to do it for decades. And I know that I'm putting a lot of burden on you for trying to, you know, give me a one, two, three for this. But nonetheless, I would urge that you do give me that one, two, three. Well, I mean, seriously, we have to reimagine Pakistan. We have to rethink uh, Pakistan. What is it that our economic policy should be doing? What is it that our government should be doing? If you look at Bangladesh. Bangladesh was, uh, East Pakistan's income per capita income was half that of West Pakistan, a little less than that, you know, at the time of separation. It is today now more than Pakistan, and it is ahead of Pakistan in every statistic. If you just control population, and East Pakistan's population was 17% less than West Pakistan's, Oh, sorry, more than more West than, Pakistan. Yeah. Today, it is 22% less than West Pakistan. If we had just controlled population growth to the level of Bangladesh, we would not have been so far behind. If you just educate women, you know, your, your participation, female participation in the labor force will go up, which is what is driving Bangladesh exports, you know, the textile export with all these ladies, you know, stitching, you know, and sewing garments. If you educate, an average Bangladeshi today is educated, uh, three years more educated than an average Pakistani. And hence, he lives five years longer than So this basically Pakistan. goes back to what Ali Hasnan was saying in terms of education uh, at, at various levels, including at the highest level where our universities are not really... I mean, right? forget, forget the... I mean, in all honesty, uh, and Ali knows this better, that all these people who get PhDs in Pakistan, I don't know, I mean, in, at least in economics, I don't know how many of them ever had publications in top 10 journals in Pakistan, you know, and and, and, and uh, there's a lot of people, you know, associated with Imran and, and other governments who've actually done a lot of weird stuff. I'll not name names, but the point is that I think at this point, we should be concentrating on primary and secondary education and absolutely making sure that every child in Pakistan is educated and we should be going after population planning 
and we should be going after law and order improvement. We can't get, you know, just have the most unsafe country in the world where not a single foreigner is willing to come and then think that you can be a normal country and have normal growth. Right. So uh, you basically, uh, you know, pointed out various things at if I were to begin to check boxes, whether it's, uh, you know, increasing the, uh, the manufacturing base, uh, adding value to what you are manufacturing and exporting, uh, targeting, uh, you know, countries with aging populations in terms of remittances, uh, bringing in FDI that's actually, uh, you know, helps you uh, manufacture and export. Uh, health care, education, uh, uh, rule of law, uh, enforcement, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's, a, it's an entire sort of, you know, uh, the entire sort of uh, a big, big menu. Um, but Ali Asnan, very quickly, as Mifta said at the beginning, that the government, the governments are so incompetent or inefficient or just simply involved in day-to-day -day firefighting that they don't have time for any of this. So if that is correct, and I believe it to be correct, how can we check all these boxes? Your, your question was, um, can we do something if, if government isn't working right? And the answer is simply no. Uh, I think that's clear to everyone. Pakistan's economic problems are really Pakistan's political problems. Um, if you look at uh, how under five mortality rates have decreased in South Asia, you see a very stark picture, which is the exact opposite of how South Asia is growing. So South Asia, you know, India, Bangladesh are growing much faster than Pakistan. Under five mortality rates, every country has decreased uh, kids dying before they turn five much more rapidly than Pakistan has. And so the, then the question is, why isn't the, you know, why isn't the government doing things to, to, to make this right? Um, ultimately, we, we have to start fixing uh, Pakistan's politics. And the, the good news is that it's actually very simple to start fixing the structure of the economy if we do. Um, and I would start with taxation. So um, for every rupee that is earned in Pakistan in agriculture, practically nothing is paid in taxes. In services, five pesas is paid for every rupee earned. And in manufacturing, 32 pesas is paid for every for every rupee earned. And so as a result, manufacturing is decreasing in Pakistan. So the, the, the amount of manufacturing as a percentage of our GDP has fallen in the last two decades. So if we were to just bring our tax to GDP ratio up to the level of India, we would add more than the World Bank's entire portfolio in Pakistan to the resources that the government has available, right? Okay. This isn't really rocket science. Once we have that money, we have to invest it, as Mifta Saab has said, on law and order and education. Now, the, the real question is, how do we create the right politics to allow this to happen? And my belief is that we have to create the agenda for reform in the electorate. Until there is, you know, a greater emphasis on ideas and not people across our major political parties and across institutions, um, we're not going to move forward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mifta Ismail, former finance minister of Pakistan. Thank you also to Dr. Sayyid Ali Hasnan, associate professor at the economics department at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear that uh, there are problems galore. Uh, and it's also clear, uh, which is more the unfortunate part of it, that it does not seem that any government is capable of actually, or willing for that matter, of actually addressing them. We'll bring more programs for you. For, uh, you can actually uh, see the CESPA uh, website on your screen. And uh, the program can be found there. It can also be found on our YouTube channel. Until next time, goodbye from me.